So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Bronwyn Hayward, who is this evening's speaker. Bronwyn is a senior lecturer in political science and is director of what we call the College of Arts Arts Scholars Program. It's a new initiative that is designed to uh, give some of the most outstanding young students we have the opportunity for some uh, specialist attention and uh, opportunities to have a deeper understanding of some subject areas and to do some service work. And we are quite excited about the scheme and we're grateful that uh, Bronwyn has stepped in to run it for us. Bronwyn also serves in Europe as a trustee of the London Think Tank Foundation for Democracy and Sustainable Development, where she works especially on issues confronting children and future generations. She is also a visiting fellow with the UK Department of Agriculture and Trade and the Scottish Government funded Sustainable Lifestyles Research Group at the University of Surrey and co-lead co researcher for the Norwegian Government funded Voices of the Future, a study that begins this year to study challenges facing Norwegian children in a changing climate. From 2009 to 2012, she was lead author of the United Nations Environment Programme's World Survey of Young Lives in 18 Countries, and currently leads a steering group with the UN Environment Programme's Sustainable Consumption Team and the UK Sustainable Lifestyles Group, developing a new survey called Cycles for Sustainability, which will follow the lives of children growing up in 21 cities in 21 countries over the next 20 years. I won't be here to see the end of it, I suspect, Bronwyn. Outside her work, Bronwyn has worked in children's media and served as a member of the New Zealand Broadcasting Standards Authority. So, Bronwyn, welcome, and we look forward to this presentation. Tēnā koe, Jim. Tēnā koutou katoa. Ka mihi mahana. Kia koutou. It's a real privilege to be home and speaking here tonight. It's a testament to the resilience and the optimism of our community that despite three major earthquakes, 40 earthquake events measuring magnitude five or more in the last 18 months here in Christchurch, and literally thousands of aftershocks, that you're prepared to come out tonight to talk about our children and to sit under a 10-story building. <laughs> And I would like to thank you and to, um, and to open a conversation about the ways that we can help our children flourish here in Christchurch and also around the world. There's a, some thanks I'd like to give just before I start, though. <clears throat> the book was um, actually officially launched in Parliament three weeks ago, and I'd like to thank all the three MPs, um, the Greens, Holly Walker, Labour's Jacinda Ardern and National's Nikki Wagner for hosting that. The New Zealand Electoral Commission scholarships, um, together with the College of Arts grants and the university's summer scholarships, supported this study, which aimed to understand how young people learn to take political action in their communities. This particular project talked with children aged 8 to 12, growing up here in Canterbury largely, about politics and their community. The University of Canterbury allowed me to take three special years of leave to work on these projects with the Resolve Centre at Surrey and also with the Tyndall Centre for Climate Change at UEA. And I have to thank uh, New Zealand at Frankfurt who are making it possible for me to take our story about our children uh, back to the Literary Festival LitCam in October and the Frankfurt Book Fest. But before beginning, I'd particularly like to thank and acknowledge a terrific group of graduate students based here at the University of Canterbury, all of whom won scholarships or earned prizes, first class distinction for their own research. The future of social science is in great hands with a new generation of researchers of the calibre of Holly Donald, Amanda Thomas, Erina Okoroa, Wakaiti Dalton, Aramiro Tarakana, Jessica Buck, Nick Kirk, Celia Sharon, Claire Bouchigig and Elizabeth Plough. And I think um, Celia, Nick, Claire and Elizabeth are here if they could just wave their hands. It's really great having you. So, yes. So, this study began from small seeds, 
graduate students went home to their home primary school with a brief to listen to how children in the communities they grew up in think and talk about politics and their environment and their community. The original brief came from some work I was doing with the Electoral Commission at the time, which was to look at the roots of non-voting amongst young citizens. And I wanted to take it back further and to think about when we first start to engage in politics and to think about the world around us, which often for many children is between the ages of about 8 to 12, when children's worldview is developing, they're getting interested in the community around them, they're starting to engage in moral reasoning and really interested in everyday questions about justice and fairness. We asked some um, fairly simple questions which surprised us. Um, things like, what do children around here do with other people? The results quickly became something much richer. And I want to talk about some of the findings from what 160 children said between 2006 and just before the earthquakes began in 2010, and then going back to talk to the schools, some of the meanings of that. But first, I just want to put these voices into a wider global context. Today, over half the world's population are under the age of 25, and they're growing up in a world that is very different from their parents and grandparents. I think we're sort of suffering a kind of adult attention deficit disorder in that we're not really focusing on how different this world is. And I'd like to look in particular at four challenges which are interacting to provide quite a formidable series of problems facing young citizens. The first is dangerous environmental change. Here in Christchurch, we're very used to natural hazards. But as a community and a nation, I don't think we've yet focused on the way in which our um, actions are already affecting the climate of our children in ways that are impacting harshly on young lives. We often talk somewhat confusingly about global warming, but dangerous climate change is already experienced by children here and now and will be experienced increasingly in the form of more severe weather events like the storms which lashed the east coast towns of Cayo and the North Island, flooding homes and exacerbating coastal erosion. In Cayo alone, they've weathered five major storms since 2007, and children in that small community have been flooded twice seriously at the beginning and the end of, two, of last year. Here on the east coast of the South Island, New Zealand children are already experiencing the prospect of more severe droughts which will be an ongoing reality for Canterbury children. Severe weather, flooding, droughts, heat island effects in urban areas are going to exacerbate the problems that face too many children growing up in poor quality homes and compound and exacerbate the complex health effects that they're currently struggling with. To add to this, children and young adults face unprecedented levels of global youth unemployment in our unsustainable and unstable world economy. We've heard the news that in Spain and Greece, unemployment for the 16 to 25 year old tops 53%. But I don't think we've really focused on the fact that here in New Zealand, we are the country with the worst proportionate share of youth unemployment in the whole of the OECD. Our young unemployed make up almost half, just over 45% of our total unemployed. There are a number of reasons for this, not the least because we're also the worst country in the OECD at keeping the 16 to 18 year old in school or training. The government's introduced some new and creative policies which are finding solutions to wrap around the training for 16 to 18 year olds. And we're seeing the effects of trade training here in Christchurch. But we're still not sure that these creative responses aren't merely shifting the problem to a slightly older group within the same cohort. Because the difficulty that we have more widely is that our economy, while it's creating financial returns for some, is failing to create meaningful new work in local communities where it's often needed most. The only way we can create that work is by accelerating economic growth but that's at rates that are simply outstripping the ability of our planet to resource that growth. 
as thoughtful work by colleagues like Tim Jackson at the University of Surrey, Juliet Shaw and the University of Boston have been working on. We haven't yet thought about how we might develop an economy based on community prosperity rather than growth, which is a reality for many of the communities that are struggling, not only in the wake of earthquakes, but austerity. We haven't yet focused on the fact that our children will not be better off than we are. The third problem that young citizens face globally is growing social inequality. We've begun to recognise this as a problem for all developed and developing economies. But I'm not sure that we yet really have had a public conversation about the role of New Zealand in this situation. I don't think we really understand that we, of all nations in the OECD, are the country, along with Sweden, where the gap between our rich and poor has grown faster than any other nation over the last 20 years. While we haven't got the uber mega rich of some of the Northern Hemisphere, and while there have been periods of plateau as we've tried different tax policies, the basic problem of this accelerating gap between rich and poor has left our children in particular in a very uncomfortable place. New Zealand children now experience the greatest gap in material or material deprivation in, all of the o in 27 of the OECD countries where we measure this. Now what does that mean? <clears throat> well it means that we've done a fantastic job for our elderly, which is something we should celebrate. Only 2% of the elderly in New Zealand live in poverty, measured at 50% of the median income, compared to an average in the OECD of about 14%. By comparison, 15% of children in New Zealand live in poverty if we measure it at 50%, compared to about 12% in the OECD. So you can see the dramatic growth gap for New Zealand children compared to a kind of an average gap. But we've achieved something fantastic for our elderly. It's going to be difficult to sustain. They're going into a very difficult situation, not just here in Christchurch. It's more like we've just ripped the scab off the social and economic problems that are affecting the whole community. But our children are going into this difficult world from a much harsher starting point. We also, nearly finished the doom and gloom, but we also know our national shame of youth suicide here in New Zealand. We're not the worst in the world. That dreadful statistic belongs to the Russian Federation. But our rates of youth suicide here in New Zealand are still the highest in the OECD. No discipline has all the answers, but I would suggest that as social scientists, we've probably left too much of the work to our psychology colleagues, and it's time that we all contributed to this debate. Finland has done some magnificent efforts recently uh, to try and turn around their youth suicide, with the result that they're not in the same position that, that they had shared with us in previous years. But we can also think about some of the lessons from countries at the bottom of the scale, like Spain and Italy, and what are the social and economic conditions that have contributed to the fact that while Spain, for instance, is experiencing really high youth unemployment, its social situation is contributing to a different outcome for its children. I must say that what started me thinking about how we might usefully contribute to this from political, difficult problem from political science was working with Spanish students in the Indigados. And it made me start thinking as I was watching the, the anger turned outward of young Spanish students, how we could help in a small way to contribute to reigniting the democratic imagination of our own students to turn suffering into constructive action. It's only a tiny contribution to a very complex problem, but I think we all have to do something. And I would acknowledge here the Gluckman Report and the new Prime Minister's uh, project on, so on youth suicide. Finally though, the fourth problem facing young people everywhere is weakening democracies. As communities struggle to hold global financial power to account, we know what that means in reality in Christchurch, as everyday homeowners are struggling with international insurance companies and trying to reignite 
the regrowth of a community when we're so exposed to international investment who might not see the great value in investing here in our community. The problems of democracies are reflected in the problems for voters. Many voters are failing to see that participation in a traditional democracy is, in, is meaningful anymore. This is contributing to, decline a vote, uh, to declining voter turnout, especially for young adults, who make up actually proportionately the greatest share of our non-voters, that's that great big white column at the start, is the 18 to 24 year old. This actually does matter because the habit of voting, and it is a habit, begins with your first act of voting. If you feel like when you participated it made a difference, you're much more likely to stay engaged. However, democracies can make a difference, and urban communities particularly are emerging around the world as new sites for democracy. More importantly, young people, while they might be fed up with voting, aren't giving up with politics or democracy. And on streets everywhere, on Twitter and Facebook, they're struggling to get their voices heard. So how can we support them? I suggest the first thing we could do is to really stop and listen. Listen to what they're asking for, listen to the situations that they're facing, listen to the problems and their solutions that they're offering. We often talk about children as future citizens. We forget that children are also citizens here and now. We don't have to think of citizenship in a traditional adult se sense as a framework of rights and responsibilities to pay taxes, to vote, to obey the law in exchange for support from the state in hard times, um, to recognise that children are also citizens in the sense of people who belong in, participate, make demands and act to support their communities. The philosopher Hannah Arendt cautioned us to take care when teaching politics to the very young. Children's cognitive abilities are developing and revolutionary or tyrannical movements have frequently sought to indoctrinate children. We can take Arendt's caution to heart while recognising that our children need support for the democratic life they have already engaged and embarked on as citizens who commit who participate and who belong in our communities already. So what would happen if we really listened to young citizens? Well, it might actually change our ideas about our own citizenship and our democracies. We're used to the idea that our actions leave a physical impact on the world around us in the form of an ecological footprint. We're not used to thinking about our citizenship as leaving a, a social impact or as having a social handprint. So what I want to talk about when I talk about what children here in Canterbury have said in the last, I promise, just 10 minutes, Jim, is, uh, is to think about three kinds of emerging social handprints, which I think we can see in liberal democracies at the moment and to think about the kind of social handprint we're leaving behind as a citizen. The first is the social handprint of fears. We commonly associate this with an authoritarian regime, and it's something we want to avoid, ideally, in a democracy. But it was actually watching, with due respect to my colleagues in England, England's difficulties in dealing with its young citizens that made me think about the way in which we are leaving behind a footprint or a handprint of fears in our dealings with young citizens. What's typical of this fears model is first, that our attitudes to agency, that is to the ability of a citizen to imagine something different and to affect change, can be very controlling. Our ability to actually deal with young people's growing sense of agency, what we're picking up in surveys around the world in all sorts of languages and all sorts of, of cultures is the language of wanting to make a difference. One great legacy of neoliberalism is a generation around the world who want to make a difference. In a fears regime, we frustrate that agency. We think about it, or we understand it in authoritarian governments when we see 
children being used as child soldiers in child prostitution and child slave labor, labor, but we're not used to thinking about the subtle ways that we frustrate the agency of young people in our, model, in our liberal democracies, when we deny them access to education, when we, for instance, in the English situation, in a complex social um, moment, the government moved on two fronts to cut back access to tertiary education and training with a rapid increase in tertiary fees, but to also cut the education maintenance allowance for young high school students. That combination was part of a trigger at a very difficult time for England for the series of riots that we've seen. And it was interesting talking to lots of young people and interviewing them at the time. It was that sense of that frustrated agency that came through that was quite remarkable. But other things are also happening in this complex environment of, of, of fears. One is environmental exclusion where you see young citizens being forced, I mean it's dramatic when you see democracies turning against their young citizens through riot control, through kettling, but also through just simply excluding young people from public space. Here in New Zealand, like England, we have a legacy of the mosquito, which is kind of, we like to think that we have um, excluded children from public space by pre-earthquake. We played Barry Manilow music, if you remember, no offence to the, in public spaces or light, light music. But we also used the high-pitched mosquito alarm, which is hard for adults to hear, but is really um, hurts children's ears. And increasingly, those are kinds of average forms of exclusion that are being used, for instance, in England. And we've used them here. Uh, the other kinds of environmental exclusion just simply come from lack of space to play. Play England estimates now that in, in southern England, children have about the access of a kitchen table, about 2.3 metres of, square, play, of uh, square space to actually call their own. Access to public space matters. It matters for democracy, as Michael Sandel, the philosopher, has pointed out, and it just matters for the expression of the self and the community. But the other aspects of the fears model that are emerging is a kind of a retributive justice, a view that justice is about blaming people or an eye for an eye, that the problems that we face in our economy are all caused by greedy bankers, not an economic system. We're not thinking about the underlying causes, but we're trying to find people to blame. We're also in this process silencing our young citizens' imagination for thinking about new ways to engage with problems. So those might be some of the features of perhaps the English situation, perhaps closer to home at some moments. But what about here in New Zealand? We want to learn from what's gone wrong. So what goes right? One of the dominant forms of citizenship that's an alternative, which is also emerging in Britain and here, is this kind of, and what I call the smart handprint of thin environmentalism, where we're teaching children a kind of citizenship that revolves first around a focus on the individual as an actor for self-help. We tend to think about children's citizenship as being able to be engaged in the market and we're teaching our kids to think that they can make a difference themselves. I can be an entrepreneur. I can, if I'm not shopping till I drop, I can at least be a thoughtful consumer. This action about teaching children to take individual responsibility for their community and also to act through the market is remarkably strong in interviews with New Zealand children. And colleagues at Otago and at Lincoln, Jane Higgins and, um, and uh, Karen Nairn's study has also shown for an older generation of school leavers the same strong sense of self-help agency and participation in the market. But interestingly, what goes along with that is a sense of justice that is very, that's an a priori or universal sense of justice, that we have a set of rules that we all will follow, which isn't actually teaching children about the moral reasoning that they need for the embedded and difficult situations in which you might find yourself in every day. But we do place enormous faith in this model of citizenship on young citizens or citizens of any age being able to affect technological transformations to rescue us. 
So we are teaching our children and we are teaching and thinking in our science policies about the creative ways in which we can innovate. Low energy, new solar power, what can we do to solve the problems that we face? Now there's nothing wrong with the smart citizenship model overall, but the difficulty is that it leaves unchallenged and unquestioned the underlying drivers of the problems that we face. It's not challenging the social and economic injustices going on in our communities. So how might we think about our citizenship and teach citizenship differently? To conclude, I'd like to come back home to the ways in which here in Christchurch, our own students and our children have taught us to think about the environment and their citizenship. One of the starting points is from Sam Johnson and Jade and Matt and the six other students that began the Facebook page and Louis um, and all of their efforts that then grew to 24,000 students and people networking on Facebook and 10,000 people on the ground. But it's also had a remarkable legacy for a younger generation of children in Christchurch who are learning about a different kind of agency. They're learning about social action acting together to affect change. They're also learning about the way in which we need to understand our environment in which we live at a deep level, not just playing and being involved in it, but substantive knowledge. Both of those two experiences are important. Understanding the real world and experiencing it matters for environmental education. We also see and need to think about new ways in which we can teach embedded justice. One of the things that's most striking about working with students, and many people here are teachers and will be working at Canterbury or teaching, will know what I mean when we say that the students here are very mature through this earthquake because there's a level of learning that goes on about understanding everyday struggles of justice that helps accelerate moral conversations and debate about what's fair and right. And I think celebrating and building on that is a really important legacy. But also, how can we decenter our deliberation? Now, this used to be hard to explain before Occupy and the Arab Spring, but how can we connect our local struggles and problems in a local community with communities everywhere? How can we encourage our children to connect with others from their local school, to other schools, to other communities, to other places and times. And listening to children made me think a lot about lots of ways in which we decenter, to use the late Iris Young's exp expression, or, th or think beyond uh, our own immediate ex experience, to connect with others through storytelling, through ways in which our decision making is connected to others. And now, as we see through Occupy, or through the Arab Spring, or on Twitter, it's, it's easy electronically, but we need to actually also cultivate and think about the democratic messages and lessons that we're sharing as we dissenter. And finally, there's something very special that happens for democracy that we don't often think about, which is the process of thinking beyond self, the self-transcendent set of values, which we're finding increasingly important. When children and citizens learn to think not just about my own experience, but to engage in empathy with others. So I suppose that's the point, and it's probably an easiest way to open up discussion in order to talk about the kids. I realise I didn't even read out of the book, but I'll come back to some of the conversations. But this point about self-transcendence is, is really where I would like to leave this conversation just at the moment, or start opening up this discussion. In 1965, the ecologist Rachel Carson wrote about nurturing a child's sense of wonder about their natural world. I argue we also need to, to nurture a child's sense of wonder about their democratic world, to reignite our imagination about the extraordinary possibilities of ordinary people acting together to affect change for a more just and sustainable common future. Here in Christchurch, we have the legacy of some remarkable thinkers, Margaret Mahey in children's writing, Elsie Locke in peace activism, 
Kate Shepherd in her contribution to uh, women's suffrage internationally. And Sasha McMeeking last year reminded me of the, the seven generations of struggle of Naitahu for justice over time. This is a legacy of social agency that comes out of Canterbury that we can usefully contribute, not just to New Zealand, but globally. We can also collaborate across our parties to agree at some basics, to set some measures to lift our children out of poverty and to support them to flourish. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou kato. Roman, thank you so much for a very thought-provoking presentation. I guess it troubles me as a media person that we have so much fragmentation of the media and new media which enable people to tailor their consumption of information so narrowly that we may not have genuinely informed citizens who can go into a polling booth and really understand all the issues. And I suspect that's another of the challenges that emerges in and around this. <clears throat> 